Hello. Tonight I'm going to read to you White Flight. The name of this short is called White Flight. It's a bit graphic in nature, but this is a drama series, so please enjoy White Flight. I used to go after sexually liberated women over wholesome girls, thinking with my dick put me in unwanted positions. For my intent until I find a woman, and maybe a mistress, was to smash and dash. The first time I saw something of a sexual nature was in 1994. I was still 12 and hit puberty. It was like night and day. One minute the ghetto girls around my way were loud and obnoxious. The next, I'm staring at every female's booty that walked by. Prior to puberty, the only thing I knew about sex came from sex ed classes. But during spring break of that year, my cousin and brother found old porn VHS tapes in my uncle's closet. We watched in my mother's room because it was the only place with a VCR we could access. It was around noon and every adult was at work still. This porno was 1970s old, but the women were hot. This flick had sexual scenes with black women I wished were my neighbors or school teachers. One woman had a chest that could distract anybody's eye contact. Another looked like Tina Turner with this huge black wig, but had a rear and Jennifer Lopez would want. My preteen mind accepted that this was sex between man and woman. I couldn't tell whether what we saw was lovemaking or hardcore sex. All I knew was that money shots were never mentioned in sex ed class. Porn movies, girly magazines, and rap music videos altered my idea of what a beautiful woman looked like. I became hooked on big booty women and women who were Dolly Parton stacked. I learned a valued lesson dealing with Adana during spring of 2004. I was a part-time student at Miami-Dade College and she was a registered nurse my friend hooked up with when he worked at the hospital. Adana was a chunky white girl who looked like a cute version of Rosie O'Donnell. Though she could have lost some pounds, she did have a chest that made you wonder what bra held such mass. Upon first meeting, she performed oral sex on me and four of my boys. I guess coming out of a divorce with her high school sweetheart made her down for anything. One night, she called myself for some action. I couldn't bring her in the house, so I took her into the shed in the backyard. My brother and I placed old couches there in case some late night hype came. She couldn't stay long because her kid had school the next morning. So she tried orally to make me climax after my condom rap member was inside of her a good while. Her vaginal liquids that were all over the condom transferred onto her lips and mouth. After a few minutes of oral sex with condom on, she took it off. She continued with pleasing me orally, hoping I'd finish soon. But now the formula for flamethrower dick was slurped into my penis. Four mornings after that event, I used the restroom. I wanted to cry after snot like cream came out before the sharp burn while urinating. I quickly got ready, then drove without eating breakfast to the doctor. I was able to see the doctor, but waited a few hours due to me being a walk-in. I dropped my shorts, then the doc gently squeezed my penis and saw secretion. His experienced eyes recognized it was flamethrower dick without explanation. He just shook his head, then gave the nurse instructions. They administered a shot on my top left butt cheek for gonorrhea, 
and gave me pink pills for chlamydia. I called Idana to let her know she had a problem. I told her to, to get checked out, but she kept denying she had a problem. She said since she's a nurse, she got checked for everything, so I had to be lying. Adana was the culprit because she was the only person I was with in about a three month span. I never heard from her after that, but my boy spoke to her at the job. She told him that she didn't have time for little kid games. Seven months passed since being blazed. While finishing classes that summer and working my deli job at a supermarket, I didn't sleep with anyone. I slowly built up the courage to get answered whether I had HIV or not. I figured since she easily passed the flames on to me, then maybe she could have HIV. On Wednesday, November 10th, 2004, I went to the clinic near my house that offered free testing to the public. Before I got there, I envisioned clean rooms with kind nurses and doctors who understood the sensitive state I was in. Instead, I walked to the front desk where security told me HIV testing was behind the building in this mobile home type structure. I walked out through the front doors and around the back of the building. It felt like the pink pretty clinic was ashamed of its ugly little sibling test site. So they forced it to live in the shed. There are two things I hated about getting tested. First, you waited a whole two weeks if results are negative. The second was while waiting to get checked out, fine ass women walked in and out to test site and test rooms. Half of them dressed up like they were at the club. It felt like they were auditioning for the temptress role in a movie or something. Most of us men would stare at these beautiful women, but soon looked at our feet because you realized where the hell you were at. After they drew blood and I signed paperwork, I got into my car, prayed, then drove home. The first week was torture. Every number on the call ID that looked like it could be a lab, I picked up or called back. I even called back bill collectors and telemarketers. No labs called that first week. Thanksgiving came during that second week. I ate and watch the Cowboys kick the shit out of the Bears. But I was still worried. And when I worried, I decided to drink. I can't recall how much I drank. Just know I had enough for me to talk to death my younger cousins how the best sex was no sex. Before I drank and food was served, the family said prayer about being thankful. I couldn't be thankful until that following morning when I got my test reading negative in bold letters. I'd be lying if I said that I changed soon after. I still played around a little bit longer, making a few more routine clinic checks and escaping with good outcomes. But never did those other tests lead to such worry in a time when I was supposed to be happy with family. I'm at a point now where I'm open to having a true relationship. I've been celibate over two years now. Playing it safe and taking it easy is working out pretty well so far. Another brother I saw had his possible white flight moment. I know white flight is when Caucasians move out of an area once so-called minorities begin moving into their neighborhoods. In my eyes, there needs to be a secondary definition to it when black folks learn the hard way that white folks are like everyone else, if not worse. Some in the more woke community call these times nigger wake-up calls. But I figure we don't have to be so harsh. A finite percentage of black folks diss their own kind out of spite and praise non-blacks, particularly white people, 
as the closest thing to perfection. There are non-blacks who see black folks as the coolest, smartest, and sexiest beings on the planet, but for now I'll stick with what I remember. I didn't know this dude in particular, so I'll call him Buddy. He just so happened to move along the route I took to the family dollar. I don't get fly when heading to the store. That late summer Sunday evening, I was in a slightly faded Boston Celtic t-shirt and stained white dicky shorts I've had since 2008. On my feet were gray socks with neon green colors on the bottom tucked into a pair of Puma flip-flops, the same color scheme as the socks. My cell phone was playing a podcast on how some women confuse struggling with an unworthy mate as having a man's back. Buddy stayed on the halfway mark of my path to the family dollar. The whole time he's been there, I only gave him the what's up head nod twice over the last six years. I hardly saw the guy. I just know when the black 2014 Chevy Malibu was parked in front, then he was home. But this Sunday, a white chick hunched over Buddy's rear car door. At first, I thought Buddy might have put a for sale sign or writing indicating an asking price. As I got closer, I heard scratching over the conversation on the podcast. This young lady was keying Buddy's car all in the open with the sun still out. This brunette in black tights and sandy brown Ugg boots etched away, muttering under her breath angrily. I remained across the street, so I couldn't tell what she put. I walked down another 15 to 20 yards before I crossed, acting like I didn't see shit. A few steps later, I heard a window being hit. I turned around to see this Christian Ritter looking broad attack the front windshield with a golf club. I pressed pause on the podcast. I watched her finish the front before she took a few cracks at the back windshield. About 30 seconds later, her and the golf club got into a red Mini Cooper and hauled ass. Damn, buddy! the fuck you doing was all I can say to myself. I pressed play on the podcast and continued my journey for spaghetti sauce, black beans, and frozen foods. When I returned onto Buddy Street, heading back home, the police were talking to him. I felt sorry for that man. He seemed like he didn't bother anybody, paid taxes, and worked hard for everything he earned. Buddy was a light brown brother with an afro who wore a pair of old school Run DMC type glasses. He was close to average height, but a little on the pudgy side as if he worked at a desk job. A plain gray t-shirt, navy blue sweatpants, and white socks covered the rest of his body. I put the podcast on pause again when I was at least a house down from Buddy and the two cops. This time, I didn't cross the street. They stood in the middle of Buddy's walkway, maybe eight feet from the front porch. As I trekked onward, I heard all that shit he was talking. I can't believe she did this. I know it was her. She acting like some black ghetto bitch. What was her name? Ainsley Keaton Britridge, and she lived near Golden Beach. She drove her ass way out of here being childish. Are you sure you can confirm this? The officer asked. I know it's her. I broke up with Ainsley because she kept having an attitude and trying to embarrass me like I'm her child in public. I can't be with nobody like that acting like some dumb hood rat bitch. Buddy said. How do you spell her name, sir? I couldn't believe he associated that crazy chick's behavior with black women he more than likely grew up around. I looked over at where the woman scratched her keys. You can see in big letters, fuck 
at the top and you just below. After putting it all together then and there, I chuckled. I laughed my ass off once I got in the house. Serves him right, thinking just because he's with a non-black woman that his life would be peaches and cream. I don't care who you date or marry, just don't insult your own kind because of some bad experiences. Brothers and sisters like this only end up looking stupid in the end. They don't realize that negative energy you hold deep within you only attracts negativity. Crazy, jealous, ill-mannered, and ill-tempered women are found in every race and ethnicity on the globe. So if anything, take your time choosing the right one or learn to live in misery. Me, I want a woman with her mind right, spirit intact, and preferably dark brown or deep dark skinned. 100% of the major relationships I had were with black women and at least 90% of those sisters were dark brown or jet black. If my future wife is a smart red bone, I'd be cool with that. My point is I learned a long time ago that crazy isn't a genetic trait among black women. I just hope Buddy's car insurance covers privilege, white female rage. Buddy and I learned tough lessons. His pain stemmed from emotionally and mentally being poisoned by self-hate. Mine came from being stupid and having a momentary lapse of judgment. I easily cured my ailment and powered ahead, but Buddy needs a history and sociology lesson or continue having dates from hell. Though he needs a checkup from the neck up, I hope Buddy finds someone worthy of his time. I hope he figures things out fast, or he just might let the right sister pass by. I'll continue to grow my network and net worth while adding to my soul's progression. I know when my bride comes, everything's going to be alright. Thank you for listening to White Flight. Please share, like, comment, and learn. Subscribe on the way out for more stories coming in the future. Stay blessed.